Tonight's guest is Dustin. Dustin, welcome to the show. Thank you, Vic. Well, thank you for your time and for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Not a problem. Dustin, please give us a brief bio on yourself. I am a stay-at-home caretaker for my wife. She's got cerebral palsy, and I've been taking care of her now for the last six years. I'm just an all-around good guy. (laughs) I know it's not exactly what people expect to hear, but that's all I got. Well, after speaking with you at length, I'd have to agree that you are a great guy. How much help has your wife been when it comes to your attempts to come to terms with your encounter, though? Well, Vic, let's put it this way. She has opened her arms as much as her mind. And were it not for her comforting me the way that I need comforted, especially after that night, then I would probably still not know what I saw or know the intent. Well, it goes without saying, I'm so glad she brought it to your attention what you did see that night, because if you didn't know what it was, then we never would have spoken. And speaking of that, were you reluctant to reach out to me, even though she recommended that you do so, or were you motivated to do that? I was motivated. Oh, good. You loved wolves before you had that encounter. After it happened, though, that changed. What more can you tell us about that? Well... I was a werewolf fanatic, somewhere borderlining obsessed. I never thought they were real. They, uh, they just seemed like something that I could relate to somehow because they were big, buff, and bulky, and that's the same with me. But I never actually thought I was one or anything. I pretended to be when I was like six, but... Who doesn't when they're that age? And wolves in general, because of my Native American heritage, I love them. It's my spirit animal. And because of what I saw, it changed everything. My wife knew that I loved wolves. So she bought me this $200 tapestry of a family of wolves with a beautiful background. There was little branches, puppies, a mom and a dad, an owl in the background with a pink sky, trees, snow. It was beautiful. I took that down, and I folded it up, and I put it in my drawer, and I hung up a flag instead because these nightmares that I've been having every single night since this happened has made me not even want to look at a wolf. And this is just a regular wolf. I can see a dog. That's fine. I'm okay with a dog. But say, for instance, if I go to National Geographic or look up some of the things that I used to look up, such as wolves, it brings me back. And it scares me more than it should so because of this i just the wolves and stuff are taking a back seat for now (laughs) no i understand you are getting better so do you think maybe in time you're gonna be able to pull out that tapestry and put it back up i hope so Vic, because that was a christmas gift and she didn't have to spend that much on me but she did and I mean, I've got dragons, I've got any kind of sculpture you could think of. And I just, the werewolves and the wolves in general, it's like, nope, walking the other way. Well, I'm not a betting man, but if I was, my money would be on the fact that when you're ready, you are going to put that tapestry back up. But all in good time, I hope you don't rush to do that. No, (laughs) I can barely get over this right now, so... Oh, sure, but everything in good time. If you used to be a werewolf fanatic, what do you think is the best werewolf movie? Hands down, Van Helsing. Second favorite is Cursed. And I think the third one that I absolutely adore, that I actually made a Dungeons & Dragons character after, is Hybrid. And the show is basically without... Well, I mean... I'm sure people have seen it. 
so I'm not really going to not spoil anything. It's been out for a while. But there was a, a wolf on the reservation that was ran over. So this Navajo lady took it to a genetic lab so she could, you know, study it, figure out, you know, the musculature and all that. Well, they got a grant. So one of these individuals was in an accident and he lost his eyesight. So the doctors basically took the eyes and put them in the man. And because of this, the man inherited traits of the wolf. So while he looked human, he had gold eyes. And it just it's a wonderful, wonderful story. Wonderful movie. That does sound like a good movie. I've never seen it, so yeah, I'm going to have to check that out. I am kind of disappointed, though, Dustin. You didn't mention Bad Moon. That, too. Gotta love Bad Moon and Ginger Snaps. Yeah, those are all good movies. You do have good taste. You had a lot of trouble telling me about your encounter the first time we spoke. How are you feeling about it now? It's still fresh, so I'm pretty sure I'm going to get nervous again but i will do my best to push through it because the seven magical words you told me but it didn't want to hurt me well it's only natural you're going to get nervous thinking about it we're in the early stages i mean you had the encounter last tuesday for goodness sake so it's going to take time but this is going to get a lot better and a lot easier to deal with so i'm happy about that What kinds of problems have you been dealing with as a direct result of that experience, though? Well, the the problems every day that I've been having, I can't sleep anyway. For some reason, I have insomnia or a byproduct thereof, and I just haven't been able to sleep. So when I do finally fall asleep, I wake up maybe in three hours in cold sweats and screaming. I've woken the roommate up, I've woken my wife up, and they both rush in and try to comfort me, but all I can do is have this 100-yard stare and shake back and forth. And even when I'm out on the road, like, my best friend Seth that was with me that night, he works at McDonald's, so I have to travel by interstate in order to get there. And every time, no matter if it's just... A reflector, like, say, on the back of a guy that's walking on the road, or a taillight off in the distance, or even headlights, it brings me back to that night, and I get in a panic attack. I mean, it doesn't prohibit me from driving, of course, but I have had to pull over twice and put the car in park just to let it out. Well, like I told you, all those effects are pretty normal when it comes to an eyewitness trying to come to terms with their encounter. We are in the early stages, like I also said. Again, that encounter happened last Tuesday, so it hasn't even been two weeks. So you're going to have to work your way through this, but after that conversation we had, I think you can do it. It's just going to take time, and you're going to have to focus on recalling the seven magic words and not letting that experience get the better of you. Not looking at that experience in ways that have nothing to do with reality and like I told you, I'm pretty sure you can do that. If you've had a Dogman encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest on one of my two Bigfoot shows, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let me know. Well, Dustin, are you ready to tell us about your encounter now? If you'd like to talk more before you tell us about it, we can do that. There's no rush. Just say the word. I don't mind explaining my encounter. All right then, Dustin. Please tell us about your encounter now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. I have a best friend. He's my neighbor, but I met him probably about two years ago, and we clicked. We're inseparable now. And... He has been more helpful to me than my flesh and blood has. So, as you know, I live in West Virginia. I will not give the county because 
hard to know what happens when you give county information out. Let's just say that I live two hours away from Webster County. And where we were going was Grassy Creek. I've never been to Webster County except for one time, and that was to see the small little town. They have one go-mart, some stores that basically aren't active, one gas station, and it's like you drive through it and you miss it. The hospital is tiny. It's just a very, very poor county. So, on the way, Seth was telling me, I don't think your roommate will be able to handle this drive. It is two hours, and it's full of twisting and turning roads. I don't have motion sickness. I don't have car sickness. And even I got sick six times. He and I were driving. We left about seven, seven or eight. And we got there. The roads were long, curvy, a lot of forests. I've been through places on the way there that the woods are so dense you can't even see through the trees. And that's saying something. So we keep driving, we're listening to music, and we get to where we need to go, which is Grassy Creek. And as far as I'm told, Grassy Creek is... A very long, long road, probably about 50 miles before it dead ends and turns around. There's a lot of people and a lot of unwanted things up there, and I'll leave it at that. So we pull into the Grassy Creek Road, the turnoff, from the main highway to get to his father's grave because it was the day after Memorial Day. He wanted to put flowers on his father's grave. Couldn't do it Monday, so his only day off was Tuesday and Wednesday. So we decided that we'd go Tuesday. We get there about, I want to say, 9.30, roughly. And I had this very bad feeling. But even before that, that I should have taken into consideration was the nosebleed that I had. And I have a white car anyway, so you can kind of tell where I had the nosebleed because my window was down and I got sick again because of the curves. So I went to puke and then the next thing I know, both of my nose holes gushed. It was like being like a a stuck pig. It just pulled and gushed. So it took me, I want to say, five minutes, guesstimate, to get it under control before we moved on. And this road's got a lot of curves, too, but it's not as bad as the main road. So the road itself, it had a picket fence, not white, but kind of like a barbed wire fence that you use to keep livestock in. And that was on the way there. And it was a 35-mile-per-hour road. And I, I don't remember exactly how wide the road was, but I do know that it was... It had two lines. So we get there at about 930. It's dark. Last thing I remember seeing was a white trailer. It looked like a double wide, if you want to call it one, across the road from where the car was originally parked. And to the left on Seth's driver's side, because it did let him drive my car, because he knew where everything was and I didn't. I didn't want to get us lost. There was a bunch of mailboxes. Straight ahead of us was a gravel parking lot. And it's a straight walk up a tiny little hill to get to the church. This church is probably about 300 feet by 300 feet. It's a big church. But it's small at the same time. It's it's longer than it is wide, I guess. And there were lots of windows in it, lots of little candles with curtains. Seth and I start walking up the side of the church because I couldn't follow him down over a hill. The grass was up. 
I'm terrified of snakes. I didn't want bit. I was wearing my shorts and my shoes, so I didn't really have any protection anyway. So we decided we'd go up alongside of the church and try to not step on graves. We walked probably about 15, 20 more feet from where the last gravestone that I saw was. And he continued to walk on down the hill. Because his father, his grave is tucked into a corner that is fenced off. So he walks down and there's this white little shed with a maroon colored roof. And beside of that is a white trailer that's stretched out long ways. I didn't get much detail on the trailer, but I knew it was a trailer because what else could it be? And he walks up to his father's grave. And we both have our phones, of course, because neither one of us has a flashlight. And keep in mind that the only light source that I did have was the telephone pole with the light on it. A pole and a light. About 20 feet to my right. It's down the hill a little bit, but you can still see. And there was fog, you know, eerie kind of fog, because it did rain that day. And Seth is at his father's grave. He bought these two little flags from Walmart, which I thought are cool. He also bought flowers. He couldn't find any at Walmart. They were sold out, so he went to the dollar store. And he picked something up. And it was a little pretty vase, the... The vase itself was white with black speckles, and it was kind of oddly shaped, but it worked. It was a vase. So he's down there fixing his father's grave up, and I'm standing up there on the hill. So I'm looking around, and there's different kind of mausoleums or tombstones, I want to say. There was a round arched one, there was a uh, a soldier one that I do remember, and then there was something else. And they take real good care of the graves there because there's lighting around the graves. That way if you come out at night and you want to visit the cemetery for your loved one, you can see what you're doing. And down below, Caddick cornered or off to, if you're staring front ways with your back turned to the trailer, there is a brown house that's catacornered, cornered and it had white shutters behind that was an old cream and ta- uh, cream and maroon or red truck with a hatchback on the back. I guess that's what it's called. I don't want to say a camper because that's too big. It's just one of those things you put over the back of a truck. When you pull the tailgate down and open up the glass, you have access, and it keeps everything from getting wet. And beside of that was an old van that was missing a tire. Across from that brown house was a two-story white house. Beautiful house. They took real good care of it. It was it was a farmhouse. And then off to the side of that house was a camper. This camper in particular, I remember it like, Like it was yesterday because it wasn't an RV, but it was like a truck with a camper on the back of it that that comes out, I guess. And the camper itself, the truck was, I want to say, black. And the rest of it was kind of like a cream or a tan and black. So being a medium, you know, I, I was looking around the the cemetery to see where everything was to try and figure out if I could see anything or hear anything. And after about two minutes of looking around, I heard a soft echoey voice. Look up and ahead. So my first instinct is to look and check on Seth and he's not even paying attention to me because He's taking the the used flowers out and putting the ones that he bought down in the vase and rearranging his father's headstone. 
And I turned my head back into the direction of that camper. And what I saw were two orangish yellow eyes. They weren't glowing, but as I said, when you spoke to me first, the moon was at quarter stage of the lunar monthly cycle. So it gave some light, but it didn't give a lot of light. But it gave me just enough to where I could make out two eyes. And they weren't a deer eye. A deer's eyes faced, you know, kind of like a horse's. But this, I knew, was a predator because the way its eyes faced. So I'm like, what in the world is this? And I took a step to the right, and it did the same. Took a step back to the left where I originally stood. Those eyes followed me, and they blinked like like I would. So around this time, I'm going to say it was about 940, 20 minutes away from being 10 o'clock at night. And these people, I didn't want to wake them up and be like, Seth, we got to go. So I waited for about 10 minutes for him to finish, and he walks up the hill. And I'm like, you good? He was like, yeah. So we go back the way we came, and we reach the car. And he, being a silly butt that he is, left the keys to the car beside of his father's grave. So that meant he had to go all the way back just to get them. And I tore my meniscus, so I really couldn't walk up that hill again without pain. So he said, stay by the car. I'll go get the keys. I'm like, all right. Seth takes a shortcut route up to the left side of this church. And it was faster to get to his father that way. So he pretty much jogged the whole way there with his phone and I had my phone. So when I turned my head back to the way that Seth and I had just came from, those eyes were there again and they were blinking at me. They were, they were moving like this thing was canting its head or turning its head to a certain degree. And it was blinking at me and I'm like, Holy crap. So I took pictures. These pictures, you know, I didn't notice anything. I didn't even look at them until I got home because I'm like, well, you know, my wife would want to see where I'm at. You know, she she loves country life. She loves the woods. She loves nature. So I'm, I'm going to take pictures. And then that is when I felt the dread. The dread that I felt was undescribable and keep in mind that everything was dead quiet no sounds from the wildlife and the forest nothing usually there's tree frogs there's crickets there's anything you could think of even a hoot owl sometimes that make noises in the woods and everything was dead silent combine the fog with the rotten flesh that I smelled that made me sick to my stomach. And I was freaking out. My right hand was behind me. My left was holding my phone, snapping pictures. And here's the kicker. I took a picture of the white trailer that's across the road from where our car is parked. And I didn't look at it until I got home. So, one of them was there in the picture, and I didn't know that until I found it when I got home. I like video recording things as well, so I video recorded the trip there, and I got some evidence of what they sound like up close and personal. And I just, it scared me. And Seth 
comes back winded because he ran from the gravestone all the way back to the car and he unlocks it and I waste no time in getting in that car. I think that's the fastest record time that I've gotten inside my vehicle. And I shut the door and I immediately lock the door and I take more pictures. You know, I take one of the church. I take one outside my window I take pretty much every picture you could imagine possible on my phone because I have a a good camera since it's an iPhone. Seth and I, we get in the he gets in the car after that. We talk for about a couple minutes and then we turn the lights on and drive down the road. And we turn on this bridge. It goes over the creek. Which I failed to mention earlier because I was so distracted with trying to give detail that I forgot to have mentioned that on the right across from the church, there's a pavilion behind that pavilion. There's the Creek. So we go past the church, the pavilion, probably about half a mile down the road. And I wasn't even going to tell Seth about what I saw because I thought it was just the reflection of the moon. Or something. You know, it it could have been a cat. For all I knew. Because cats' eyes, they do glow. But they don't have that color. So we turn. And we come back past the church. And I'm recording. And this thing lets out an enormous, otherworldly scream. I don't want to say it's a howl because... Nothing I've heard that is a howl has ever sounded like this. This is a cross between something big and angry and something that needs a breath mint. So I look out my right side window after I hear this. And what I seen in vivid detail, it would be enough to scare a, a, a monk or a nun or any anyone who went to church. This creature had black fur. He, I don't know what gender it was. I, I dog woman, dog man. Dog, I don't know. And it's keeping pace with the vehicle. Seth looks over and sees those eyes, the same ones that I'm telling you about that I saw. He sees them and he guns it. Keep in mind this road is curvy and twisted. And it's a 35 mile an hour per road. We gun it. We do 60. And this thing is keeping up with the car. And its eyes are on me the entire time. And if I want to say or guesstimate how far it was from my vehicle, one foot away from my vehicle. So I'm looking at this thing and I am terrified, but I notice a lot of things that, that blow my mind. As I mentioned, this thing's probably about eight feet in length. If it stood up on its hind feet, it probably would have been the same height. Or a little bit taller. I I don't know. And what struck me as the most odd thing about this was its tail. This creature had a long fluffy tail like a timber wolf. And it was matted. The arm that I could see. It was missing patches of fur. Like it had gotten into a fight or... A scuffle or even had a fight with a tree branch. I don't know. All I know is it was missing fur. And I could see the musculature. Um, The neck was broad. It had a head of a canine. Its teeth, they they were long. If I had to guess, probably about six inches, the incisors. And... That the way that it looked at me 
and the way that it screamed, it's like I could see everything. I could see the mouth. I could see the lining of the lips, the way its head was. And it had pointed ears, a big fluffy mass of fur on the back of the nape of its neck down to the front of its chest. Its shoulders were wide. If you've ever seen a bodybuilder like Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was younger and first starting, that would be either what he looked like or something. This creature, it, it, it must have taken steroids. <laughs> I got to have a little humor there. But what I distinctively remember is the chest area. It, it was ripped. And the arms were long, elongated, far longer than anything I've seen. And it kind of hunched over in a way, if you want to say that. The way the back curved and the way their hips met, it was like a bipedal dog. You know, my brain f functioned and... This is a dog. It has to be. But why so big? And Seth and I, we don't speak. We just keep our eyes on the road. And when we finally get to the end across the bridge at the edge of Grassy Creek, that's when this creature turned itself around. And ran back in the way that it came. And Seth and I, we didn't talk the entire road trip back home. We just turned on the music and vibed. But I looked at him and I'm like, Seth, what was that? He's like, I don't know. I've seen it a couple of times before myself because I grew up in Webster. And I'm like, and you didn't think. To tell me that, hey, you might see something. Never did. Never told me a thing. Instead, I was the one that got terrorized. Seth was the one that was driving. He wasn't scared of it, but he also knew that whatever these things were could keep up with the car. And the only living animal I know that's able to go 60 miles per hour is a cheetah. And I don't think what I saw was a cheetah. So we drive another way instead of the way we came. We go up through uh, Birch River Road. And we come through Webster. Seth shows me around. And then we drive home. I got home probably around midnight, 11.30, something to 12. And I walk in, and I tell my wife, I'm like, you're never going to believe what I just saw. And she was like, what? What would you see? And I told her, and at first she was like, what? So she had to take her earphones out of her ears. And I'm like, I, I, I saw something that scared the living daylights out of me, and I don't know what to think about it. And I was going through my pictures and my videos and I saw exactly what was looking at me minus the glowy eyes or the yellow orange eyes. I saw exactly what was in that photograph. And I, it scared me so bad that that night I had such a vivid dream or a nightmare, I want to say, that it reached its hand through my car window after breaking it, grabbed me by the throat and yanked me out of the car, and just proceeded to eat me. And I, I woke up, and I screamed bloody murder. Woke my wife up, and she has insomnia. She can't sleep. And she was like, honey, I love you, but you have to reach out to somebody. And I was looking through my videos and everything else 
and I looked at the picture again, and I'm like, nah, this it can't be. But I saw it. So my wife told me that when I was in the living room earlier today and for the last week, that I have this 100-yard stare. I stare off. I don't talk. And I cross my arms, and I just start rocking back and forth like a crazy person. And I'm not crazy. So she has to snap me out of it by shaking my arm or my shoulder. And when I had the chance to finally reach out to you and realize that, yeah, if it wanted to kill me, it would have. Instead, it was just bullying me around like a playground bully. And I've had more than my fair share of bullies in high school, trust me. But they never scared me like that. That encounter sure has put you through it, Dustin. No one should have to go through anything like that. You did do a lot better this time around, though. It must be getting easier for you to talk about it. That's great. It's easier to talk about when you know you have a support system and people that actually see these things and knowing that you're not crazy. As you know, you're not crazy, and that's right, you do have a support system. It's not going to go anywhere either. So, please remember that. Oh, of course. How far were you two from the car when you first noticed that dog man? Uh, I don't really remember the, the exact feet, but uh, I want to say 50 yards, like half of a football field away from me. That was the first time that I saw the eyes. The second time that I saw the eyes, I was at the car and I was probably about three, four yards, maybe five away. So it wasn't exactly on top of you when you first saw it, but it was still way too close for comfort. Too close for comfort. Yeah, sounds like it. If you had to guess, how many minutes had elapsed from the time that you two got out of the car until the time when you saw it? Um, the first time that I saw it, we got there at 9.30, as I mentioned. And then about 10 minutes passed, that's the first time I saw the eyes. And then when Seth was done, probably around 10 o'clock, it was, I'm going to assume because I don't exactly remember the effect of time. But I want to say it was 10 after 5 when I saw the second set. Or saw those eyes the second time. I see. So, not too much time had passed, but it's not like it made its presence known right away. It sounds to me like Seth might have been closer to the dog man than you were. Is that accurate? It's possible, yes. So he was probably closer and didn't even know it was there. That's not good. No, he didn't know it was there. I didn't see it until it chased the car. That's what scared me because knowing that something that I'm seeing that that is folklore and seeing this thing, it just, my brain could not compute. Y'all yeah, bet your brain was an overload. It was. I, I felt every emotion I could possibly feel during the time that we were gunning it. My heart was racing like I had ran a marathon. I was scared. The hair on the back of my neck was raised. The hair on my arm even. I had goosebumps. And what I kept thinking about during this is Seth, we got to go. You, you got to outrun it. It's going to get me. It's going to reach through the car. It's going to kill us. It's going to wreck us. It's going to do whatever it wants. That's what I kept thinking. And by the time that Seth and I got into Webster from Grassy Creek, I went into that bathroom and I threw up about three times. I kept smacking myself on the cheek. I was like, man, you tripping. There's no way. No, there's no, there's, there's no way. And I wiped my mouth after I got out of the Go Mart restroom and I got myself a drink. 
And I texted my wife probably 10, 15, 10, 20, and told her, I was like, babe, I'm on my way home. We're not going to go back to Grassy Creek tonight because they wanted to go, you know, to get out of the house. My roommate and my wife, they wanted to go with Seth and I, and there was just no room in the vehicle. So we were going to go back and get them after we cleaned it out and take them up to Grassy Creek. But after what he and I witnessed and saw, there was no way. No way. And Seth and I both agreed that stay away from there because what could happen the next time we see one of these things? It, it could be unpredictable. It could get violent. It could attack you. And I just don't want that to happen. And when my wife saw the picture that I showed her, her blood ran cold. My roommate stared wide eyed and just didn't speak. And I'm like, do you believe me now? So my wife was like, I'll put this picture into Photoshop. She's really good at Photoshop, mind you. And she put a background behind it that was white and then used some kind of filter to make it to where it was kind of white-ish and grainy so she could tell that it was not filtered. And she was like, I believe you, because if it was filtered, the image would disappear. And my roommate was like, I've always believed in these things. I just never knew that they were here. So both my wife and my roommate were the sole reason that I contacted you, because I had to do something. I, I couldn't sleep. I barely ate. Um, I would shake. I would have panic attacks when I drive. And mind you, Seth gets off of work at 2.30 or 3.30 every night. And they get swamped really bad. So the latest time is usually 4.30. So I drive out usually around 12 and I wait either one or two, maybe three hours on him. But every time that I drive the interstate and I see like, reflectors from either a guardrail someone's car like red parking lights or anything it doesn't matter and it automatically takes me back to seeing those eyes and I had to pull over on the side of the road to contain myself because I would have wrecked my car I, I had to do something and I'm so 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 thankful that I was able to be pointed to you in order to reach out and tell my story. Because if I didn't talk to anybody about this, it would have ate me up. Well, like I told you, I'm so glad you found out about me. If it was only a foot from the car window, you got too good of a look at it. With that in mind, were it serious more in the top of its head or on the sides? Uh, it was basically like your stereotypical wolf ear. They were on the top of the head, not at the side. I see. Did it seem to be having trouble keeping up with your car when you were heading down the road at 60 miles an hour? Not at all. Not at all. It was fast. It was big. And it was very mean looking. And it kept up exactly with my car. I would have to say that the strides alone were... I can't even compare them. I can't run that fast. Well, of course, yeah, no one can. Would you describe its movements as being more on the smooth side or jerky? The movements would be like a dog. That's the best way I can describe it. Or a cheetah. You know how they run really fast? This thing, this creature, all I can tell you is that it could go really fast. It was like, unlike anything I have never seen before. Well, I hope it's unlike anything you see in the future. Hope that was your last dogman encounter.
I sincerely hope and I pray to the man upstairs that I never see this thing again. Ever. Well, that makes two of us. You've made a lot of references to werewolves tonight, Dustin. Do you think dogmen are actually werewolves or do you think they look the way they do 24-7? I know that werewolves are not real. Werewolves are basically mythological creatures. What I saw was physical and in the flesh. And I would say, if without a doubt, that it's very unhappy and very bored. Because if it wants to chase me or single me out, to terrorize me, to entertain itself, that's one thing. But after rereading everything and looking at the stories and listening to your videos, I would have to say that it's like that all the time because there's absolutely no way that werewolves exist because it's not possible unless you're Native American and believe in either Wendigos or Skinwalkers. My mom used to tell me a lot of stories because, you know, her being Cherokee. So I learned a lot about the Wendigo. And to be honest with you, I would rather have seen a Wendigo than I would have what I saw. And that's putting it lightly. I mean, Wendigos, they're naturally scary, but I'm not afraid of them. Because my mother used to tell me all about them when I was younger. And it's like, I don't have the characteristics or the niche. I don't fit that that uh, need to kill or anything else like it does. So, I mean, I'm not under its radar. And to be actually honest with you, a cemetery, I'm going to say probably about two, three miles, maybe four down the road. Actually, there is one of them that hangs around there. And I have seen that with myself. And I'm just like, well, that's real. And of course, I question myself, but it's not going to hurt me. So I don't pay it much mind. And other than that, like I said, I would rather see a tall and skinny ribcage bone showing thing than I would have what I saw. Wow. So not only have you had a dogman encounter, you've had a Wendigo encounter as well. Yeah. I mean, I've seen it, but. It hasn't came toward me. It just stopped and looked. And I went on about my business. Well, thank goodness that's all it did was stop and look. I produced another podcast called My Paranormal Experience. Would you be interested in coming on My Pira X and chronicling the encounter you had with that Wendigo? Sure, I don't mind doing that. I'd love to share some of the stories that I have with you. Oh, great. Well... If that's the case, we're going to record that show, and when I do record it, I'm going to post a link here to that show on the description for this show tonight, so that way people will be able to listen to it. You're a median. Do you think that has anything to do with you having that experience? I I really don't know. I mean, there's been theories out there after I've done some research that they're portal guardians. Some say that they're just a missing link between Sasquatch, Bigfoot, and another lineage. I I really don't know. And to be honest, I didn't even know what a dog man was until my roommate pointed it out. Well, you definitely know what a dog man is now, unfortunately. What's been the most frightening thing that's happened to you with regards to your work as being a medium, Dustin? Well... There was a situation about last October. And this is when a bunch of weird things started happening around my apartment. The first day I walked in and I was fine. And my wife asked me, she was like, did you move the tote and open the closet door? Because usually we'd keep it open so the cats can 
go back and forth because they love being in the closet. And I'm like, no, I didn't even turn the light on and the light was on. So I thought nothing of it, turned it off, put the tote back in front of the closet door. And later that night, the tote was moved by itself. The door was open and the light was on. And I'm like, wait a minute. Didn't I just close that? Not even three hours ago, maybe. So I went in there, checked it out. And the moment I stepped into that electromagnetic field, it knocked me on my butt. I was down. I was out cold. Um, my roommate, my wife rushed in, of course, to check on me. And they said that I was so cold. It was like I, I was dead. And I didn't know what happened to me. Never had that experience before. So they helped me up and we contacted someone by the name of Chris Delaney. He is also a medium and actually one of my good friends, <laughs> surprisingly. He was trying to help as best he could. And there is a crystal hippie shop. In Flatwoods that sells protection runes, stones, anything for the Wiccan faith. So I was like, all right, I'll do it. So she gave me some selenite. It's a little white crystal, clear, and it's pure heavenly light, they say. And I've got tiger's eye, I've got Apache tears, and some other rocks with me that serve as a protection barrier for me and especially it's in a little sack that's white and I carry that sack with me everywhere. I also have a necklace. It's made out of black obsidian. It absorbs negativity. And once all the negativity is absorbed, it breaks. And I've had this since December. So anyway, back to the story. I was laying in bed and it was probably around two, maybe three, because wife and roommate and I were all night owls. And I go back in there and lay on my bed, listen to my tablet, listen to my music, just enjoying myself and trying to unwind. The door creeps open again after the totes pushed by itself. And what comes out of that closet, mind you, is nothing but a big shadowy figure. Never seen it before in my life. Didn't know what it wanted. But it was looming over me, and I screamed. Bloody murder. Men aren't supposed to scream, but apparently I did. So, the three of us, for about, I want to say, a week, we did everything. We had a buddy system, because we weren't taking any chances. And come to find out, Probably three days after that happened, I got three scratch marks on the back of my shoulder. And these were long. And it got so bad that I had to call a friend of mine to come in and sage my home to get rid of whatever that was that was in my closet. It was an angry old man. That's all I can tell you. CJ and Mindy were the ones that took care of my problem. And... For a while, I, could, I didn't trust that closet. I'd keep looking at it, wondering if the door was going to come open or the light was going to come on, and it didn't, it didn't happen. Thankfully, about a month or so after that, I was able to finally close my eyes without worry. And then about six months after that, I want to say, Seth and I are down below the apartment. Because my apartment's an upstairs unit. And the apartment below us was not rented at the time. Nobody lived there. Nobody had been there for a year. He and I started hearing noises. And it was like somebody was pounding on the door. There is a gold little hinge out in front of the door. And it's called a knocker, of course. So when you bang that, it echoes throughout the entire complex. We started hearing that. We started hearing people running back and forth in the apartment. The doors were going nuts. 
It was thumping. It was thudding. Whatever is in the apartment below me cannot get up here because I have a ward in place. So as long as that that uh, blood grave, whatever grave dirt bottle is in my room, it it can't touch me. I Chris told me that I am a trans medium. And when I go into these medium things, I tend to fall over. So whenever I do have these sessions, I want to call them, I have to sit down. And it's insane. But like I said, I can commune with the dead even before they cross over and after. And many people look at me like they're skeptical. They don't believe and I'm like, that's your right. But I know what happens to me. Wow. I don't know how you could ever get used to being able to do that. Yeah, that is so strange. And the experiences you had, I don't blame you for screaming when that figure came out of the closet. That's horrible. Most of the experiences I've had have been horrible. Like I said, I've been attacked. I've been scratched. My stomach's gotten nauseated. It's not something that I can handle. And after I come to, I'm so weak and exhausted, I can barely move until I've rested and regained my, my strength, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. You could ever get used to that, like I said. And speaking of those experiences, due to you being a medium, you've also dealt with demons before. How would you compare the fright you felt when you've dealt with them compared to the fright you felt when you had your dogman encounter? I have experienced demons before. I have had several encounters with negativity, negative energy. I lived before I moved on a piece of property that was on top of a, I want to say a civil war burial ground. And I've seen a lot of things there. I've heard a lot of things there. And when I was six years old, I distinctively remember going out when it was I want to say December, and I found this gigantic print. Didn't know what it was, but now that I think about it, it was a large print, like like a dog's back paw print. So I guess when I was younger, I I didn't know what it was, and there were like two different prints, and there were like five feet apart. They were big strides. So I haven't thought about that since then until I started reliving and reflecting. But as far as the demons go, there is a portal in my uncle's house. He will not let anyone in that home to clean it, to sage it, to get rid of it. There is a headboard in the back bedroom that has, how should I put this? The design etched in the wood is a devil's head. And this is with the horns jutting out to both sides. You can see the eyes, you can see the nose and the, the mouth with the beard. And that place, it gives me the heebie-jeebies. I can't even step foot on that property without a nosebleed or feeling nauseated, or getting attacked. So, I had to go back to my old home. I want to say probably about a year ago. And I no longer speak with my father because he was abusive. So, I don't want anything to do with him. But at that time, I was still underneath of the Stockholm Syndrome, I suppose you could say. And I went back to the property went into that home, and I got slammed against the door facing. And I, there was nothing in front of me, but I felt dread. I couldn't breathe. It was like somebody had their hand wrapped around my throat. And the more I tried to push it off, the weaker I got. Now, my mom has been passed away now for about 15 years. And I swear that she had something to do with me getting out of that house. 
I didn't have the strength to fight it off. And by the time I got back to my vehicle, I was coughing and sputtering. So that was pretty scary. And I walked off without my uh, protection runes and stones when I went back there. So I just, I'm glad I'm alive. But as far as the demons go, they don't scare me as much as they used to. Because, you know, it's like, I believe in the paranormal. That's fine. But this dog man, growing up your entire life believing that werewolves are fake. They're, they're a myth. They're a legend. Half man, half dogs don't exist. And then finally coming face to face with one. This situation is far more scarier than any of the demons I've had to face, including my own. That's hands down the honest truth. Yeah, it sure would be nice if we lived in a world where things that look like this weren't around, but unfortunately, you know the truth about that now. If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content, that's an option. To find out how, please go to dogmanencounters.com forward slash podcast. You saw it two hours from where you live. Does the fact it happened that far away from home bring you any comfort? It brings me a lot of comfort because I don't have to see that thing again. I now know why people at night on Grassy Creek stay inside. Because if they were to see these things, they would freak out and Lord knows what would happen. But I think that the people of Grassy Creek know of these things and know to avoid them by staying inside at night. So, I mean, if they know about them, congratulations. But I certainly didn't know. It sure is a shame that those people are living as hostages in their own homes like that. No one should have to live that way. Well, it's about time for us to get out of here, Dustin. But before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Just, uh, if you have had similar situations as mine, I don't mind that you comment on the video naturally. And I also want to say thank you to my lovely wife, Mary, for reaching out and helping me get in contact with Vic. He's a good dude. Well, thanks for saying that. I'm just glad to help and so happy to be in a position where I can do that. So if you ever need more help down the road, please let me know. I now know that and I appreciate it. (laughs) Oh, you're welcome. Well, thanks again so much for coming on and sharing the details of that experience with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks again so much. Have a great night.